Okay, everyone, welcome in. New edition of Celtics Beat. Adam Kaufman, Evan Valenti, we're here as always, and I can't think of a better way to wrap up what was a thrilling season than with a guy who tells you every step of the way, every dribble, every shot, every pass, what is going on. That is, of course, the radio voice of the Boston Celtics, or as I like to always say when he joins us, the longtime voice of the Boston Celtics. Sean Grandy, Sean, it's great to see you. We, we've got a ton to cover, obviously, but uh, are you at least, you know, the day after now? Or I know you'd probably rather be on a plane to the bay than talking to us, but are you able to take a breath, take a break? It doesn't happen yet. Uh, it's 24 years of doing this, and the only analogy I can draw is if you're running on a treadmill and you're flying on a treadmill and then the treadmill just stops because that's how this happens. There's no ramp down unless you are 10 games out of the playoff spot and you know you're headed for the lottery. And I've you know, been lucky enough to, in, in my years, I've only three years of all the 24 I've done this that I have not been in the playoffs. And you re- always know you're going to be in it. And then you don't know when it's going to end. And then when it suddenly ends, it just goes quiet. And obviously, given the, the chaos of the West Coast back and forth and it being the finals and it being a much longer run than anyone anticipated, it reminded me of my first year with the Celtics in 2002, where that came out of nowhere. We were expecting maybe to make the playoffs, and suddenly that went till uh, nearly June 1st. All of that, yeah, it's kind of a, it's a foggy day. It's probably the best day to ask me about things, whatever, because I'm too, I'm too foggy and cloudy to like disguise and you know cover up my answers. So you just get yeah. straight unvarnished. Is that Tommy unvarnished that they used yeah. to do? This, this is basically unvarnished. Yeah, the next day. You on the truth serum, which is good. Yeah. Because like I said, we have so much to cover, but just sort of, and I, I don't want to. I, I was just saying this to Evan before we came on. I don't want this for however long we're chatting to be a, a whole lot of game six reflection I, you know i want to look back on on the season and an incredible story and incredible growth and you put something on twitter about just you know what a memorable year it was obviously for boston and thanking the fans for you know being there all, every step of the way with you and max and obviously we thank you for your great coverage and you know year in and year out like you've said you've you've been at it a while and this team is perennially basically in the postseason but you know, what's, what's just really nice, what, you know, again, sort of that 10,000 foot view or whatever, what's, what's really nice is, you know, we are for the first time, certainly in my time doing this podcast, and the first time that since, you know, for anybody, radio or TV, first time in, in mid-June that we get to sit down and for the very first time, look ahead to next year and look back on the season, you know, I guess save for like the weird COVID year where the Celtics finished in September, you know, this is a, a traditional season. We're now like we're less than a week away from a, a draft that no one has talked about. No Celtics fans even care about because they don't have a first round pick. Free agency le- is less than two weeks out, but the Celtics have everybody of note under contract and coming back. Everyone in the rotation, you know, they, they have very little money to spend. Maybe they can be creative, obviously, in terms of the TPEs and they have a mid level exception and all of that. We'll talk about that stuff late, but you know, it's, it's, it projects anyway to be a, a, a relatively boring, at least start to the free agency period again, barring trades. It's, this is, this is what it feels like folks for, for championship contenders for, for, for teams that are always here at this point of the year, golden state, you know, six out of the last eight years in the NBA finals and now four time champions. This is what it feels like going into an off season for the teams that are really, really, you know what? It's nice. It's really nice, Sean. And I think one of the things I have to work on is being better about the very, very vocal minority as we talk the day after that. And you could feel them. It wasn't just the last couple of games. You could feel it during the Milwaukee series. You could feel it during the Miami series of intolerance, dissatisfaction with what was one of the most absurd seasons we have ever seen. And when I say do better, I mean, I've got to pull back and say, you know what? Be upset that they lost game six. Be upset at the way the series played out. Be upset that there was a chance. Obviously, this was a real opportunity to win a championship. This wasn't the 2017 Warriors and 2018 yeah. Warriors. Uh, I think it's interesting to talk about it on this day because you're still – you don't have the distance from it. And you're trying to almost guess while you're still in the forest what the trees are going to look like in the distance. But I believe the day after 
we're going to divide this this season into three parts, which obviously we talk, everyone knows what the first two parts are. You know, the 25 and 25 start and being three games under 500. A nine week run in which the Celtics weren't the best team in the division or the best team in the East. They were the best team in the NBA by a wide margin. It was not close. This team put together a 50 game run up until game four of the finals that compares favorably, Adam, gentlemen, with any 50 game run in the history of the franchise. That's how good this team was for that period of time. But I'm starting to wonder, we always look for that moment. Uh, you know, you have these autopsies. How many times Bill Simmons would call me the day after the season, right? And we do this, you try to find that one moment. Three years ago in the season that went horribly wrong, right? When it was supposed to be Boston and Golden State at the end. And that season went off the rails. It was always easy for me to pick the day that Kyrie went public at Madison Square Garden in the shoot around and say, oh yeah, ask me in June. And everyone went, what? I thought he was, there's a clear dividing line there between what happened the rest of the year. The Celtics, as I said, put together that nine-week run. Best team in the NBA, not even close. And there's almost a poetry to the fact they went from 11th in the East, and when did they take over the lead in the Eastern Conference? The Sunday night game against Minnesota. After they had beaten six Western Conference teams in a row, by, they had led by 25 in all of those games. They just blasted everybody. To me, that was the peak of the whole thing was that west coast trip i was doing the games on tv with scal scal and i didn't do a single game by the way we did six or seven this year i don't know how many we didn't do a single game this year where the celtics did not lead by 25 in the <laughs> second half every single game we did but on that night there's poetry to it the celtics go from you know the bottom started at the bottom now they're here leading the east what happened that night rob williams got hurt from that point on the celtics were really good they were a really good team. They were playing at the same level as the best teams in the league, but they were not as invincible. They never were invincible again after that moment with Rob sort of feeling it out. That's how vital everybody was, how those five guys were together, that taking away one piece of it really left it a little bit off balance. And it was an amazing run full of snapshots and games we'll be talking about forever. But that to me – is going to be a dividing point. It certainly is in real time now. That to me is the dividing line between best team in the league and one of the best teams that made a great playoff run. Yeah. And you know, you, the irony, I, sorry, just to, I'll let you go, Ev. But you know, the, the irony of that is though, Sean, is that, you know, if, if Rob never came back and was the same player, I would wholeheartedly agree with all of that. Except in the last two games of the finals, he looked as good as he has all, all season for the most part. You know, it was it was so many like the bench didn't show up. Tatum, obviously, and we'll talk plenty about Jason Tatum, had a terrible NBA finals as good as, you know, his first three rounds were like Rob was, you know, one of the only guys even in keeping them alive in those last two games. I don't, I don't disagree with that. And I'm not saying that it was the Rob injury that, ca that sure. started it to me. Yeah, and but that, that was, that was the healthy. If you look at the point at the dividing line. There's there's the three the three parts of the season, right? The really difficult first yeah. 45 something games, then that nine week run of absolute insanity of overall play, but particularly historic road dominance, which continued in the playoffs. This was I didn't do the final numbers after the fifth game in Golden State to see if they dropped any further, but this was the fourth best road team in the history of the league in terms of scoring <laughs> margin ever ever when you consider regular season and playoffs put together better than 08 better than the 2018 because that 2018 was terrible on the road that terrible is overstating it that's a sure a hot talk uh, hot take theater thing to say but uh they did lose their first what six games or something like that on the road in uh, atlanta and cleveland in uh, 2008 yep. but that to me was that there, it never came back to where they were dominating again even though they outscored milwaukee by 30 something points and I have a counter to the Chris Middleton argument that people are making, by the way, and they outscored it. Miami, if they had lost game seven in Miami, it would have been one of the most lopsided playoff losses in terms of scoring margin in NBA history because they outscored them by, you know, five, six points a game. Uh, but it all, to me, the finals went, and we were talking a little bit about this off air. I thought for three games, for three and three quarters games, I thought it was going to be another – Grandy he must have been hit by lightning as a kid that he can see the future the yeah. way I had the finals pegged. It was Bill Simmons and I were talking in San Francisco before game one. 
And I told him, he said, what do you think? I said, well, we're, we're all always wrong, but I think this, the first two get split out here. The Celtics win one of the games in Boston pretty easily, call it a blowout, whatever you want, but there's no drama to it. And then the other game in Boston is going to be the close game that comes down to a what, the wire that Golden State always wins, that the Celtics did not win this year, and that game is going to decide the series, and there won't be a seventh game. And all that was exactly right, except I thought the Celtics were going to finally break through and win that fourth game. I don't, I haven't said this publicly anywhere yet because nobody specifically asked me for a pick. I thought the Celtics were going to win the series. I did because they had the resume of a team that wins the championship. And I thought uh, you always can't see history changing. You can't see the torch passing until it gets passed. Nobody thought Golden State was going to win in 2015. Even though I kept telling Max all year, they're going to win. He's like, no, no, no. Teams like that don't win. I'm like, that's because it hasn't happened yet. I really thought that they were going to find a way to do this, but uh, it's, it's an off season to discuss uh, the last couple of games and why they didn't. But I just hope the 50 game run before that somehow does not get buried or become a forgotten part of history. Cause I know it's hard to get back and Milwaukee didn't get back this year because the Celtics stopped them from getting back there mm-hmm. this year. It's incredibly difficult. Golden state went six times in eight years. OKC never got back again. Bad things happen. Injuries happen. We ha- literally have no idea as we're talking here. And it sucks to lose. And Steve Kerr was exactly right. Losing in the finals is the worst because you're, you know, in theory, you're tied with the other 29 teams, right? Even though you have right. to lead. So feel bad about all that. But man, this was, I've seen some things in 24 years and I've never seen a turnaround like this to go teams that go from, Hey, this team isn't playing well. Hey, they're really rolling now. But to go from what they were the first part of the year to the best team in the league, beating the living daylights out of everybody every night, particularly on the road, it was insanity. Yeah, and you look at that game four, you know, this is one of the things that I think we lose track of because we're so in the moment of living the day-to-day stuff and trying to anoint a winner after just a single game. And, you know, it drives me crazy with how – how and I get, I get why. Like, you got to fill content on TV. I totally get it. There's segments need to be filled, all that stuff. But like there are there there are razor thin margins when you get to this point, you know. And we talked about this, you know, pre-show. And as you mentioned, you know, Game Four, you know, that's going to be the or one of the games in Boston. It ended up being Game Four um, is going to be the, the game that decides this all. And if it it's not for Steph Curry going absolutely nuclear in Game Four, and he was absolutely brilliant in that game, you know, if Boston takes a three-one lead, and that's probably it. You know, Boston probably closes that out. Now Golden State, hell of a resilient team. But that's the thing, and you and when you comp- when you combine that with the fact that Boston had such a dominant stretch, and I was we were talking with Gorman during that run, and there was a Utah game where I asked Mike, I was like, is that there, there was a game? I, I don't remember if it was at home or on the road because at this point there's been so much basketball. Oh, that was a home game. That was a home game. game in March. That was a home game. It was the yeah. best start to a game I think I've ever seen in my life, and it was like it was comical, and Mike and Scal are laughing on the air about the dominance. It was just like, it was on both ends. Everything was going in. They were stopping everything. When you factor everything in together, I know we're all still some various forms of like raw and emotional from the moment. But when you look at oh, all- Isn't there like 12 steps or something? There's like, you have to go through all the anger. Right. Yeah, I <laughs> accept it. We're, we're not through them yet. Like, yeah, no, we're not through yet. Not I'm, the I'm, on, I'm on like step three. I'm, <laughs> I'm all the way there. I, I, I'm- Look, as, as John has illustrated, and, and I've pointed out a few times about certain things, I just don't know how you – I mean, again, not winning the championship is awful. But I don't know how we get to the finish line here and we're not excited about what this team has accomplished and what this team could look like going forward. Like I was listening – we talked about Simmons quite a bit in the show. I was listening to his last pod with Joe House, and, like, the, the concept of – were the Celtics better off if Jimmy Butler hit the three? I'm like, why are we this depressed? Like, what are we, what are we doing here, Sean? What is this? You're not. And that, by the way, if Jimmy Butler hits the three, my God. I mean, people are talking. Now, listen, Jason Tatum is going to carry what he's going to endure now comes with the territory of being – I'm skipping ahead, right, to our inevitable topic. Then. Sure. Tatum is going to carry with him what comes with being one of the top players in the game. And guess what? The Celtics did it to Isaiah and the Pistons did it to Michael Jordan. And there's a long history of this in the league. And it's, this is Jason Tatum's time to go through it. 
and he will, and he'll be better for it. But if the Celtics lose game seven in Miami, that is David Tyree, Bill Buckner, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, that, that is on that list because they were up yeah. double digits with three minutes to go. And it was insane that Jimmy Butler got that, you know, got that look, but that, you know, looking back now, should we have known that they were lucky to win the, the lucky is the wrong word, but they, they were got away with game one against the Nets. Uh, they needed these epic performances against Milwaukee. Was Miami good enough? It, it, look at the Celtics I'm talking about in February and March. Does Miami push that team to the 48th minute of the seventh game? That's why, I, to me, there was a difference between – and again, and the other question, too, do, does Golden State win the series, A, do they win it the way they want it if the Celtics don't have to learn these lessons in the Milwaukee and Miami series – and those series don't go seven like they, you know, the Celtics had controlled those series and won them in five or six. Does the Golden State series play out the same way? The same thing just happened in hockey to the Rangers, who had an amazing playoff run, but they ran out of gas because they messed around early in the playoffs and they had to go seven games and seven games and seven games. They had nothing left by the end of the, you know, they kind of had a very similar finish because they were up 2 0 on Tampa and had a two goal lead in game three and then blew that lead and didn't win again. And, uh, you know, listen, it's all part of the process, all this stuff, but the the lessons that you learn are about the value of every possession in the playoffs playing for a championship. And it seemed like the Celtics were being taught that lesson in game five against Milwaukee, taught that lesson in the Miami series, by Kyle Lowry. And Kyle Lowry, I could jump higher than Kyle Lowry in the series right now. And yet that dude, <laughs> and the, the idea of scratching and clawing, look at Lowry two years ago in the bubble in Toronto. The Celtics had to take the title belt out of his cold, dead hands in the final minute of the seventh game. And that is the urgency that I think comes with time. You have to learn that. I think that's what frustrated some of the fans because fans knew it because fans are older and had been through it. And they knew that that urgency wasn't there and turnovers were piling up and not valuing possessions, but that's the difference. And that, you know, that was the biggest lesson. And I don't think Golden State's got enough credit for the defense they played Thank and you. forcing a lot of those. I mean, come on. Thank you. <laughs> State, yes, Second Boston. defensive team in the league this year. Like it's not like they're going up to chop liver here. Boston was number one. Here's what everybody is so they glom onto their narratives. Boston was the number one defensive team. Golden State shoots threes. No, that's not facts. Do not back that up. Golden State was the number two defensive team behind the Celtics. By the way, here's another one that we heard all series. Golden State and their magic third quarters. They're insane. This insane third quarter team they are. Who was the second best third quarter team in the NBA this year? Boston. And then there's the gap between the Celtics and the rest of the league. So all that stuff is just people like to glom onto the top story. It's why Steph Curry, people still say he's the greatest shooter ever. He is the greatest shooter ever. Guess what? He's one of the greatest players ever. He is not just a shooter. He hasn't been for many, many years. And people finally, because they didn't know, Steph has been playing, you know, he's playing this disrespect game, which, listen, we all love us some Steph Curry. But, dude, I'm being disrespected here. These people don't know. Everybody (laughs) thinks you're the greatest guy in the history of the world. And there's nobody with any common sense that doesn't think he's a top 10 player all time. Well, they, they just think his wife can't cook. That's all. And the discussion today, it's really, it's funny because I think it's perfectly fair today to have the LeBron, Steph, best player of the era conversation. He's earned the conversation today. And I saw, I saw a stat. I love this one because it just shows you how people want to just ride with what is happening now and never step back. It was a list of the statistical differences between LeBron and Steph. It was taking everything Steph has done and LeBron has done together, eliminating that, and then just adding on everything else LeBron has done, three finals MVPs, two more regular season MVPs, all-star appearances, whatever, that just the difference between LeBron and Steph is enough for a player to go to the Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but it's a fun, listen, it's all a fun topic. They deserve everything they're getting today. Steph does, should have been the MVP in 2015, right? Obviously, they gave yeah. that to Iguodala, even though LeBron yeah. did the series great, doesn't matter, but at, at the end of the day, there are many things that happened in the last six games, particularly in the last two games and six minutes of the series when everything changed, uh, when the Celtics were at what I, you know, win probability, which I like, 
Celtics had an 83% chance to win game four in the fourth quarter and go up 3-1. And from that point on, it fell apart. But all of us here, we knew Steph was going to be Steph. How many of us thought two weeks ago we'd be sitting here saying unequivocally that the second best player in the series was not Clay Thompson, Jason Tatum, and Jalen Brown, but Andrew Wiggins? The, the whole thing is just, it's, it's fascinating and, and we will get back to Tatum, but the, you know, there, well, there's a lot there, obviously the, the fact that had they won that game four and I'm not, I, I think most people think this way, this is not like a, 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 you know, wild take or something. This is common, you know, belief. If they win that game, they're up three to one. I think we all believe they win that series. They don't yeah. drop three in a row. Like they find a way to get that job done. Fact of the matter is, even though it happened, I still have a hard time believing they lost three in a row and went down in six simply because they hadn't lost three in a row since, since December. December. Since December. So the fact that it, it it happened is nuts to begin with. But, you know, we were, I think it was maybe Ian Thompson, Evan, that was with us, you know, when earlier in the playoffs and we were talking about this. Like, I, I believed, you know, for a variety of reasons that the Celtics convincingly in, in my mind anyway it didn't always you know number of games pan out convincingly but I I was convinced I would have viewed it as a disappointment if the Celtics didn't win the first three series they had I was certain they were better than Brooklyn I believed without Middleton they were better than Milwaukee I absolutely believed they were better than Miami Golden State I didn't know how to feel going into that series and now watching it play out yes it's easy to say like you know the the better team won because it won like Golden State you know I think championship medal and and veteran having been there before and all that stuff it comes into play but the reason that you do have some people and i see some of this you the reason you have some people sort of harping on the celtics choked it away or it's a lost opportunity or call it whatever you will those turnovers to have at least 15 turnovers in the four losses to average 18 in the elimination game at home to turn the ball over 22 23 times you know for jalen brown who it certainly really good in the finals overall but to look like at points that he didn't even know how to dribble easy for me to say obviously i'm not in the nba he is but you know to the 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 way the ball would come out of these guys hands like i i go to a point credit in golden state and it's really good defense but i also look at it and say man a lot of those turnovers especially in the in the clincher a lot of those turnovers were unforced it was just the the celtics being careless reckless chaotic with the ball and i i almost wonder you know culture wise like how do you it, it looked lazy at points and it's not a lazy team so how do you fix some of that stuff going forward with the same group a couple of interesting things there uh that as we say in the parlance of the day there's a lot to unpack there it was a for the sound bite is this the reason the celtics fans were so unhappy was because it just felt instinctively right or wrong it felt as if the Celtics were losing the series more than Golden State was winning it. And I think that was, that was driving people crazy. There's a second point about Jalen, which is pretty interesting today as we're talking today, you know, less than, um, where are we, 20 hours after Golden State won the championship and became the second team after the 85 Lakers to do it in Boston, that Jalen Brown, he at times looked great in the series. He had an unbelievable year. He didn't make the All-Star. He didn't go to the All-Star game because he missed so many games. In the first right. half, like, that's the only reason why. And at times, it was like I, I was almost uncomfortable with the love and the praise and everything that fell on Tatum when Jalen was right there yep. with it, having this amazing year. But it's funny right now today, the reverse of that is happening, which is all of the heat and everything is falling on Tatum disproportionately. With Jalen, who's like Jalen's getting a free ride, but Jalen had a lot of those turnovers as well. And it's going to be a learning process for him as well. I mean, you saw throughout the 50 game run we talked about, and at times watching, you know, these NBA experts and the national people watching Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown just marveling, you know, what you have here. And this is why for all these years we've been saying, yeah, they're, you know, people break them up, you know, trade one of them, and this team isn't good enough, whatever, that there are. 25, 26 other teams lining up saying, give up, we'll take that roster. We'll take that salary situation. We'll take all of it. Um, but listen, you don't, there had to be, for the Celtics to lose three in a row for the first time since December, there had to be a reason why it was going to happen. I didn't certainly think that they were going to lose three in a row and lose the series. So something extraordinary would have had to happen. And something extraordinary did. They turned the ball over constantly in ridiculous ways. And I under, I will say this about myself, I underestimated the value of experience. I didn't dismiss it, 
but I thought I was really much more of the mindset that youth is always served, that the young team eventually becomes that. So like, why not now? We never see it coming until it actually happens. So I leaned on that. And I will tell you guys this, I put, listen, I didn't put all the stock in it, but I definitely put too much stock into that late season game out there in which the Celtics just mauled them in San Francisco. Yeah. And it was, if you watch that game, and that wasn't like a game in November or January, that was late. And I had to see the schedule in front of me, but I don't think there were more than 12, 13 games left. That was late, fairly late March, St. Patrick's day, a little bit later, certainly in the final month of the season. And the Celtics went out there and clubbed them. And it was not close. If you watch the two teams that night, you would say they're not on the same level. They're not on the same, you know, plane. That was the game when Steph got hurt because Marcus beat him to the loose ball on the floor. And I think I was overly influenced by that. Clay didn't look great. Clay wasn't great in the series. But I was probably too influenced by that one game thinking, man, there's there's a disparity between these two teams. Yeah, it's like it, – it's – to me, it was interesting because if you look at the what the way the Celtics looked, like especially Tatum to bring it back to him, like it seemed like one team was was fresher, and it seemed like Golden State for some reason, even though you have guys that have been playing the league for a long time, they've had deep runs in the playoffs, you know, six to eight years. Um, they seem to be a little bit fresher, and Boston seemed to be just over exhausted, and there's reasons for that. I mean, the main players on Boston because they were getting nothing from their bench players. And I'm not trying to, you know, pick on Grant and Derek and, and Pritch, especially Pritchard, who I've been saying to everybody that asked me was in the toughest spot of anybody, because if he's not three of five from three point range in the first five minutes, he's just not going to play. So, you know, it's hard to have rhythm that way and have hard to have feel that way. But like the, the, the main guys, Tatum, Brown, smart, you know, those guys were playing a majority of minutes. I think, I, I, I'm not, don't quote me on this. I, I think I caught a little bit like Tatum ran 10 more miles than Curry ran according to second spectrum in the finals. Like yeah, that's, I think it was, it was three the playoffs, which yeah. by the way, and there's the, that's an indication too. We're talking about Steph and how everyone from the time he got in the league has said, well, he's not one of those guys. Like he's not going to be an NBA player. He's not going to be a great NBA player. He's not going to be an all-star and look at what the Celtics just did. They just beat Kevin Durant. Giannis, Jimmy Butler playing as well as he ever had. And sure. there's the one guy they couldn't beat. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just yeah. another another thing for the resume. This was, and by the way, that's another factor here. That and ask any of the guys from the '80s. This was the toughest road any Celtic team has ever faced to get to the finals. I'm not even sure that's debatable. You could say there were conference finals over the years. Those Sixers series, you know, in '81. Yeah. Mm -hmm. conference finals that were tougher but the Celtics teams in the early days either didn't have a first round got a bye in the first round or played a bad team in the first round the 08 Celtics who we rightly so romanticize about beyond belief and should it's one of the greatest teams in NBA history they faced a team that was under 500 in the first round the Celtics faced Kevin Durant Kyrie Irving and the team that was favored to win the east at the start of the year by the way just like two years ago in the bubble Celtics swept the preseason favorite in the first round, beat the defending world champions in seven games in the second round, then got Miami in the conference finals. It was an identical run, except this time, obviously, they, you know, they flipped the script and had these amazing signature wins led by Jason Tatum. We know that we got the Al Horford game in Milwaukee. We got the Tatum game six in Milwaukee. You got the Grant Williams game seven. Yeah. Um, and I just hope Again, going back to the theme of the whole thing, be sad today. It sucks. Be sad watching the Golden State Parade. Be mad at Draymond for wearing a Celtics t-shirt. But if you, respect if, it, actually. If there go the spoils. You know what? Like I, I said, I was more di I disappointed. Is don't don't take this and like pull it out of the podcast and make one of those little Sean Grandy says and stuff. I was a little <laughs> bummed. What time is it in the podcast? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Make the mark time stamp this one, right? I was bummed out that Steph was kind of going heel on the crowd and like you know taunting a little bit the crowd in Boston because it just seemed not so much out of character, but obviously he had worked himself up into some frenzy because a couple of talking heads on TV said whatever they said, which is again, if you're still looking for motivation in the finals, come on. But I just I thought it was ridiculous because for two reasons. One, he's the most universally loved and praised player there is, and rightly so. 
and it's funny him coming to Boston because there was no question over the last decade, Celtics fans or not, who's the most popular player outside the Celtics in New England and in Boston and a lot of cities, obviously. How many little kids are wearing Steph jerseys? Uh, yeah. you know, obviously, my son was a big Steph fan. And that Why was like one of the biggest things. Clean. Yeah. One of the biggest things for me in this run, and it really helped put a lot of stuff I hate in perspective, but it did in a lot of ways, was seeing people say, oh, it's great. You're back in the finals. I was seeing it completely through my son's eyes, who is 10. And living it through him and dying. On a, there, after game five in Milwaukee, we walked home. There were tears. There were no words. He went, and you feel like the worst father in the world. Like, what have I done? to my son he was just miserable after game five he went upstairs and went to bed like no nothing there was no consolation i had nothing and of yeah. course, you know we, we know how it turned out but seeing it through his eyes was not only amazing as a father but it also was a reminder to me as the say it with me adam long uh, time long, boy. look i kept it out of the copy for a reason <laughs> by the way why isn't that a t-shirt like max max now is making t-shirts every time he opens his mouth that's true yeah, we can't. Why not? The long time voice. You got a picture of me with a cane and a big one of those like hearing aid things. Well, you, big horn. You, know, you need a podcast on the CLNS Media Network. I guess that's you. probably, yes, that's probably true. So <laughs> he's seeing it through his eyes. That's what we need another Celtics podcast. Oh, yeah. that, more. That's what we need more content, more people talking and nobody listening. Yep. Uh, seeing it through the eyes of the 10 year old reminded me, as the long time voice of the Celtics, that yep. the fan base turns over. That the Celtics hadn't been in the, we all remember, most of us listening to this, have strong memories of 08 and 2010. I was there for goodness sake. I had more memories of that because I was courtside as opposed to being up at the top of the building. I remember everything. But he, they have not been in the finals in my son's lifetime. Okay. I know he's only 10, but that change, the fan base turns over. And that's why to see for Garnett Day late in the season in the playoffs, to see not the, when I first came here, you'd have, Havlicek coming back and occasionally Mr. Russell would come back and you know Bob Cousy would be around you'd see the legend now Eddie House comes back and Perk comes back and Big Baby you know when he's not on They're parole, old. whatever like we'll bypass that little detail uh, Ray, but you Allen, see, oh, Ray Allen getting an ovation I mean, Ray Allen, Allen coming back I, I will tell you this I mean there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff I can tell you but I bet. Uh, Ray Allen hit if not the biggest shot in NBA history, it's on the very short list, right? As yeah. clutch as clutch can be winning that championship for Miami against Ime, by the way, uh, yeah. that I have never seen. I've seen Ray Allen knock down six or seven threes in the NBA finals in game two, and I've seen Ray do all these amazing things. I have never seen him nervous or even close to more nervous than I saw him talking to him backstage before going out for the Kevin Garnett thing because that was a day – that weekend was so intense, and that day was so intense because nobody really knew. Ray was sort of coming back in the fold, but he didn't know what the reaction was going to be. Everyone forgets, Ray got booed out of the oh. He came oh. back with Miami. It was oh, brutal. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was, it was, yeah. And by the way, a lot of that came from KG. Fans took their, the cue from yeah. KG and – John, Again, you, Ray, not to cut you off, but I mean, no, no Celtics media outlet in, in the last decade has talked about that more than this show. Uh, <laughs> well, because so I you know, listen, we, Max and I have staged a lot of disagreements over the years, right? And we do our show, we do our thing. We've done it for 27 years. I can think of very few legitimate, I don't know, disagreements is the wrong word, but like legitimately saw things differently. But he would not accept, no, oh, no, it's not that bad. I'm like, you, you've, you are outside your mind if you don't think Ray is getting killed by the fans here. Absolutely. He, didn't think, he yeah. predicted that he was going to get a big ovation. And I'm like, I don't think you're reading the room right. And Ray got killed here. So he didn't know. And listen, Ray's a human being. If he wants, listen, he wants his number retired. And of course, you know, he wants that love. Why wouldn't you? Right? He he says, somewhere. Right. It's but and I'm not <laughs> right. He to say he deserved, I had no problem with the fans. I'll tell you this. I know I'm jumping around. I was nervous last night. The trophy presentation, if I'm Joe Lacombe, I know I just won a championship. Even if I didn't mean it, I'm probably saying something about the great fans of Boston 
and what a great <laughs> team the Celtics are because the room was a little bit like, yeah, I don't know how this is going to go. Watching yep. the, the trophy presentation, and it was, oh, you know, particularly with Draymond up there. And it's ironically, go figure, Draymond's the one that, you know, was complimentary of the fans and, and the whole thing. Uh, but at when Ray, you know, Ray was nervous before that. I think a lot of people were. I'd never seen Scouts nervous, you know, hmm. doing that MC bit or, you know, whatever his part of it is, because that's KG, that's how KG kept you, you know, as on edge. And it, it worked. Let's go back to Tatum because, you know, we've, we've mentioned Tatum kind of here and there, but let's really focus in on Tatum for a few minutes because, you know, it really was, you, you could talk about the minutes, like, you know, Evan highlighted minutes earlier. Like Jay, I was reading it earlier, Jason Tatum, he played more than 3,700 minutes across this season, which was more than 800. Uh, what or sorry, it was like 700 and change, 740, 750 more than Steph Curry on the other side. It was, you know, hundreds more than any of his Celtics teammates, you know, even those regular, you know, guys in the rotation, fellow starters, whatever, like consider, I mean, he played more minutes. He's played more. I don't know what the exact number is, but Jason Tatum has played more minutes since the resumption from COVID, you know, in, in yeah, I, I tweeted that a couple of weeks ago because I was curious. <laughs> yeah. So I'm probably stealing it from you. Then it anybody... it's not, but it's not close. It's not close. And by the way, ah. hi, Olympics. Yeah. Was the right thing. Yeah. 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 Right. So we have to acknowledge that, you know, he, like if he looked gassed there the last couple of games of the finals, I mean, he was, but people will also look at it and, and, you know, it's, it's fair to say, look, this guy was 24, you know, how much should, you know, he be able to handle, you know, I, I think on the one hand he went out and obviously proved, you know, to anyone that said, and there were people, you know, Jason Tatum isn't yet a number one, or he's not yet that guy that can take you to the NBA finals or can win you a championship. Well, Jason Tatum, you know, he didn't do it alone, but he largely carried this team to the NBA finals. He was the, you know, the clear number one, as good as Jason Tatum or uh, Jalen Brown was throughout the year, to your point, you know, Jason Tatum was the number one. He was the guy that, you know, he was the guy that, and, and had so many great moments in the postseason throughout those first three rounds, but in the finals, whether you want to say he was gassed, whether you want to say he was, he wilted, wasn't ready for the moment, was, you know, too much bitching at officials, you know, too, too many careless turnovers, too much driving for contact. We could look at it any number of different ways, obviously, but the fact of the matter is six games, he really didn't even have one good one, you know, one kind of okay one, but by his standards, a very lofty standard that we hold him to, he had a very bad NBA finals. And so where does, you know, he, and he owned it after to his credit. He owned it after, but where does he go from here? You know, knowing full well, like most greats, and, and if he's going to be a great, and I think he will, most people think he will. Most greats don't win a title at 24. He's ahead of schedule in terms of even just getting there. But where does he go from here? Well, it's interesting because LeBron, think about LeBron, not just his first final, the second one too. 2007 against San Antonio when guess what? He was the top guy like Tatum and they crushed him and they swept the series and they took him out of it completely. And then the, the meltdown, right? 2011 against Dallas and LeBron had that really bad finals. Couldn't even, uh, J.J. Barea was guarding him. Couldn't even get by J.J. Right. Barea. And we've had this conversation, right? Like to me, I know once in a while, it's not like we get, we get killed for it, but I tend to have a more national view and that's my style, right? In calling the games. Obviously I'm telling the selfish story and I'm telling it from that perspective and I'm seeing it through that lens. But it's impossible for me to not pull back and see the bigger picture of NBA history as it unfolds. Steph's place and his legacy as these finals are happening, the passing of the torch or the not passing of the torch, and Jason Tatum now following the same path that LeBron went through and that Isaiah Thomas went through and that Michael Jordan went through. And that it's that, you know, there's something comforting about it. That it's now sort of, you know, part of the tapestry. Uh, and of course, he's ahead of the ahead of the curve in any way. Interesting point. A couple people brought this up. And I got to thinking about it that the what we're, if you want to you call it meltdown, whatever we're calling the turnovers and the general play. Six years ago or five years ago in his rookie, four years ago, his rookie year, they go to game seven against Cleveland and they lose the game, but it wasn't this way. It wasn't like folding under the moment. It wasn't turnovers. It wasn't, it's interesting to me that that team that was so young and you know, Tatum and, and Jalen were so much, Jason Jalen was so much younger four years ago, and yet it, they didn't lose that way in the Cleveland series, whatever. It's interesting that it would happen now. 
Um, yeah. I, I don't, I, I think we need more time away from it to, we're doing the same thing that we said, I hope people eventually don't do is yeah, Jason Tatum did not have a good final. Why were the Celtics in the finals? Because Jason Tatum willed them there and played against Durant and Giannis and Jimmy Butler for three rounds, beat all three of them, uh, had some of the most epic games anybody his age has ever had. I think where it hit home with me, at some point, somebody either tweeted this out or this, this little factoid came out, and I think it often bears repeating. Jason Tatum is younger than Tom Brady was when he won the first Super Bowl. Hmm. Right. That is, whoa, okay. Let's just take it a minute. And that I think a lot of people are talking about this today, but I've been mentioning it during the series that Steph was 26 and LeBron was 27 and Michael was 28. And, you know, the KG, Paul Pierce, Ray Allen were all in their 30s when they right. won the first championship. So I just, knowing if I'm falling back on the history of the league, forget the individual nature of Tatum and how he's always gotten better in every situation, that the history of the league says – that the great players go through this, learn from it, and get better. Yeah. Does the way that he played part of that finals bother you, though, in terms of just stylistically? Like, you know, the the driving specifically for contact and just how erratic he was, you know, under and around the hoop and missing so many layups as a result. It, it just – it seemed like he was really just getting away from so many of the things – that he did well throughout the year, so throughout the playoffs. Those are the things that happened in December or January. I asked Ime last night, and what turned out to be our what, 106th and final pregame conversation of the year, I said, you and I have had this conversation, you know, had 106 of these, and a lot of them early in the year were talking about driving into contact, turnovers, complaining to officials. Why are we having this conversation again in June that you and I had so many times in November and December? And I think, by the way, the Warriors play into that because it's different when you're playing against a guy six or seven games in a row. And you can lock in and you know to win the championship. Steve Kerr knew on his list. I mean, obviously Tatum is number one. Number two is taking away the Rob Williams. Pack the paint. They're, the Celtics have to make threes to beat us. And by the way, when the Celtics made their threes, they were unbeatable this year by anybody. And that, that was the, the recipe to beat the Celtics is make them shoot threes. Saw what happened in game one. And, you know, that was, that was the difference. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think, of course, it's frustrating. It should be frustrating. It's supposed to be. The Celtics, in large part because of the way Golden State played them, did not learn the lessons that the Warriors were begging. You know, they were teaching them throughout the entire series about having to change, stop being stubborn. And it's funny because it's funny the year would end that way because it was a season. The, what, the season that just unfolded in front of us. The reason it never happens is it's the season we have when we're 10, 11, 12 years old and we have our favorite team and they're not very good. And we say, well, if this guy hits 30 home runs and this, this pitcher wins 16 games and this guy develops into a closer and that kid we call off from AAA ends up hitting 280 and being a good second base and you do this in spring training and you make this list of things. And yeah. all eight or nine of those things, of course, if those nine things happen, your team could win, but that never happens. Right. The Celtics this year, if you go back to the start of the year, you say, well, I mean, they can't get to be a championship caliber team. But if Tatum becomes a top five player, if Jalen right. continues his trajectory, if Rob Williams suddenly goes from being, you know, this erratic player to being a dominant force on both ends, if Al Horford could become the player he was three or four, guess what? All of those things happened. I've never seen anything like it. All of those fantasies that you would have about this team happened, and that's why we're sitting here on June 17th talking about a game that was played last night. You didn't see it coming, therefore it makes it so much sweeter than some of those more like 18 Red Sox or, you know. I, I don't, I'm, I'm jumping you only because I'm jumping you because I love, I've used that analogy often with people about this year as it was, for, when I was saying sort of why not the Celtics, I was saying that in 2004, 2007, and you better believe in 2018, the Red Sox were the best team. There was no question. But they never historically had won that title in the years where it's sort of up for grabs. And five, there's four or five teams that could win. And this and the NBA doesn't have that a lot. It certainly didn't in the Golden State Kevin Durant run. There weren't six or seven teams that could win. There was one or maybe a second. This was one of those years where five or six teams could win. And going back to what you said before, I was not as confident 
to me, I will, you always stick with what you picked, right? Because you, you want to feel like you had it called and you were right. I was a, when everyone was going Nets or Lakers or whatever they were saying at the start of the year, I was a strong, wholehearted Milwaukee Phoenix rematch guy with Phoenix winning yeah, this year. So I had, and I was looking pretty good until they both lost the game seven, right? On the, on that final day, particularly when they're up three, two on the Celtics. I'm like, I'm going to get this one right too. The Milwaukee and Phoenix are going to go. And the reason I wasn't like all in, Hey, the Celtics are going to win the title. There's a, there's video of me going into game four, Celtics are down two one in Milwaukee. And Abby asked me what I thought. And as you know, as a, not a, participant who enjoys hot take theater i said all right you want one i have one for this night going in celtics are down 2-1 it's game four i said the winner of this game doesn't just win the series the winner of this game is going to the finals which turned out to be right i wasn't sure at that point the celtics were going to win the series because i thought the bucks were going to do it if they didn't but the reason i didn't say win the championship that night because i if you had said to me golden state's going to be in the finals i would have probably gone all in and said the winner of this game wins the whole thing is because I wasn't sure, I felt confident, or I I really thought the Celtics could beat Golden State in a seven game series. I wasn't a bet the house or full Red Sox season ticket plan, uh, bet all that on them beating Phoenix in a seven game series. I do want to get back to Tatum because that's kind of what we started on. And again, he's going to wear a lot of this. And this is kind of where I, I kind of, as, as bad as it was, and I'm not trying to say it's like best case scenario for him, but you know, this is going to be a wake up call for him. And I go, it's going to be, you know, tough to deal with for a while. He's going to be the butt of a lot of jokes. People are going to say so many stupid things about him on the internet and on television and in podcasts and radio and all these things. Um, but if you step back as what this is, what this podcast is attempting to do currently and look at what Tatum was and what he is now, again, it's hard to not be excited about what's coming next. Because if you go back, maybe last year, maybe the year before, I'm not, I can't pinpoint exactly what it was. But I remember listening to Dwayne Wade during the middle of a TNT halftime show talk about how, you know, Jason Tatum can make any shot in the world. He's practiced every shot a million times, blah, blah, blah. But the next step that Tatum has to do is find a way to make his guys better. And this playoffs, more than anything else, confirms that there is a playmaker gene inside of Jason Tatum and all the double team stuff that he saw throughout the entire playoffs and all these great defenses that were thrown at him. And I'm not trying to say, um, you know, like Brooklyn had a great defense, but you look at Milwaukee and what they were able to do, uh, Miami and what they were able to do. And then Golden State being the second best defensive team in the league. Like Tatum saw a lot of really tough defensive coverages for three months straight. And with the exception of the last, you know, series passed it all flying colors. I mean the guy took took a really huge leap in that area. And as I as we sit here and and you know sort of digest everything. And again, it wasn't a great finals. You know, Kobe, as as people mentioned, Kobe had a pretty not pretty not great finals at one point. LeBron's had some not great finals. Um you Kobe know been, by the way Kobe shouldn't have been the MVP in twenty ten. Yeah that should have been Gasol. Yeah, Gasol. Yeah, no, question. Yeah. no question. No mm-hmm. question. Um but you, you look at, like, okay, this is a fork in the road sort of moment for a 24-year-old Jason Tatum. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to bet on the, on the kid who's 24 years old just playing his first NBA Finals and didn't have a great go at it, but had a lot of really great moments, not only throughout the entire season, but has had really great moments leading up to the season. And I think we're going to lose track of that in all this mess – that's cr- like I've avoided listening to. If you're not a if you're not a basketball podcast or a basketball radio show, I have avoided every single one of those shows because it's just all garbage. There's no actual discussion taking place of what is actually happening on the floor. It's just all oh you know it's all hot take stuff. It's all just for clicks and for and for views and all that stuff. I, if you want to actually break down the tape, like. Jason Tatum, yeah, wasn't fantastic, but I learned a lot about Jason Tatum over the past year, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm firmly, even more so, 
in team Jason Tatum than I was when the year started. And I, well, I, I would bet more on Tatum because he had a bad go at it. Right. I think you bet. I think you go more in on him, a player that the Celtics got, by the way, the best player in the draft in a year that they went to the conference finals. By the way, if you don't, if you've lost track as to how spoiled you are as a Celtic fan, you did not have lottery years. And yet, because of this once in a lifetime trade, you got Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown yep. while being good, which is, you know, it's impossible. This is why, by the way, this reaction to, uh, we didn't win the championship. It's terrible unless you win a championship. Or we went the, uh, the one that I think pushed me to a different place was when the Celtics went to game six of the conference finals two years ago and people were spitting on it like it was nothing when it was one of the best Celtic teams to ever not win the championship. You've, you've mentioned this several times. It was the best basketball in the Brad Stevens era. Oh, no doubt. No, there's no question. No question. And, you know, Gordon Hayward, listen, there were all these things that always happened, right, starting with uh, after 08. You know, in 09, you have Garnett got hurt, and then Leon, second round. 2010, Perk gets hurt, right, in the final final couple of games. 2011, Dwayne Wade does this like, flying hammerlock and throws Rondo to the ground, and Rondo is done. 2012, Avery Bradley chose to have the surgery rather than play through it in the conference finals. You know, flash forward to 2017, I, they weren't going to be Cleveland anyway, and the Isaiah thing. 2018, you didn't have Gordon Hayward or Kyrie. 2019, sank on its own. Uh, 2020, you had Gordon Hayward. And like there was always a there was always a reason. Maybe that's why this is more difficult for people to accept because the Celtics fell short as a team. You know, the same team that had dominated just fell short. But I'm I don't know how you can not be all in on on Jason Tatum. My hope for that kid is that he spends the next few weeks not getting anywhere near a basketball and yeah. just his dad and enjoying his life. Because by the way, the other thing that comes with playing in game six of the NBA finals. You just talked about the draft and summer league. Uh, we started training camp last year in September. So it's not going to be, it's not, I mean, we're, we're, we're like six weeks away, six, seven weeks away from getting the schedule. This is, this is going to happen fast after a series of really short off seasons. So that, you know, this, this, that, you know, this could be a fatigue issue too at the start of, you know, next year when they, when the Celtics start 12 and seven next year and people lose their minds. Yeah. About, oh my God, it's just terrible. We're not going to go to the final. Okay. <laughs> Yet another thing, by the way, that makes the Warriors run so incredible being in the final six times in eight years. But the, so we, I, I think we've already been talking over an hour. So I'm, I, but, I, but Adam, hang on. Because yeah. don't, the last two years, the Celtics went to the conference finals. Yep. Made the playoffs last year. Golden State missed the playoffs two years in a row. So you're sure. talking about putting miles on or whatever. Ask Steve Kerr about when they got to the finals in 2019, how exhausted everybody was right. after five straight runs. This was a boon to them. Everyone's like, oh, it's amazing. They went from worst to first. That helped them. Right. You know, now in this sort of recharge and this, this extra title. I don't know. Does this happen? If they if Steph stays healthy or Clay is a little healthy and they make kind of medium to long playoff runs, particularly last year when the season went so late, in the June, the Celtics played in June last year, even though they only went to the first round. What if Golden State, yeah. instead of getting eliminated in the play-in, what if they put together a little run and they ended up playing into you know deep into last year? So these things could be a be a benefit too. Well, Sean, I mean that's why in, in large I wasn't going to bring this up because because you know we we've been running so long to save this for future shows, but just to hit it quickly, I guess that's that's sort of my number one concern right now about Al Horford next year is you know like it's it's a foregone conclusion that he is coming back in the eyes of most because he's he's on the hook for almost 20 million dollars whether you bring him back or not so you know 26 million it, it seems like a no-brainer guy was awesome this year you're one of the anchors in your defense you know he, he played like he was 30 of the year but here's the big difference that not a lot of people are talking about right now he's going to be coming off this like weeks-long layoff you know, starting next year, assuming he starts off the year healthy versus this season, coming back to a familiar situation in Boston where he didn't play for half season. Like he couldn't have been more fresh and rested and relaxed and mentally prepared and all of it going into this past year. And he played like it throughout. He was awesome. But I don't know what now 36 year old Al Horp is going to look coming off a long run like this next year where he played, you know, whatever the final number was, but upwards of a hundred games. I don't have a clue what that's going to look like. How many guys signing up right now for that Sam Presti club med vacation 
where you get yeah. like, a full salary and you get locked out of the practice. So they're like, don't, don't show up here because you might help us win some games. I think you're going to, I mean, who knows? Nobody knows anything on June 17th, right? But my guess is you're going to see, uh, as Max likes to call them, Detroit National Parks, the DNPs. And the, uh, and I think you're going to a lot more, you know, Al's going to be more like that starting pitcher on three days rest. Um, and I think you're going to be very careful with Al minutes, which is why, and again, not to open up a new thing here towards the end, but one of the discussions over the summer is going to be about the depth. Obviously, everyone knows the Celtics are going to have to be deeper on that bench, but I think they're going to have to be deeper over the 82 games now to get through them. Yeah. Al being the perfect yeah. example of that is that you're going to need another big who can play big minutes on the nights that Al's going to, you know, take the night off, which you should. The, uh, the the last thing I did want to hit on, though, and, and we can do it quickly, but because it, it, this is very much an offseason topic, but for years we've heard from ownership, Wick Grosbeck obviously at the front of the line, when we have a contender, we're going to spend into the tax. We're going to spend, you know, as, as long as like we're right there. Now, I don't expect them to spend like the Warriors where your tax bill is higher than your actual salary cap, but you now have, you know, a – I'm looking at it, you got a, a mid-level exception for six and a half million, but more notably, you have four TPEs, the trade player exceptions, that are all worth in excess of five million dollars. One of which goes all the way up to seventeen million dollars that you obviously got in the Fournier swap. They are in position to get creative, to spend, to really add to this roster, and and you know we don't have to. As good as this team is, don't get me wrong, we don't have to look at it and just say. Run it back. Run it back with with, you with your eight you nine. You can't say that. You can't say just run it back. Look at you know everybody wants to talk about the Chris Middleton thing. They're going to get him back. The Bucks are going right. to be better. So you can't just anybody saying just run it back is clueless. So my question is, do you expect Wick and company to quite literally put their money where their mouth is? Uh, of course, I them to- I I absolutely do. Except. I reject this notion because people get mad too online. They should be spending it if it makes sense, if it's the right guy. There's this sentiment that they should just spend the money because they have or spend it for the sake of spending it. Or when they were trying to get below the apron and they were trying to do because it made more sense and it gave more flexibility, people were acting like it was their money, right? That right. It was just spend the money to spend it because that will automatically make us better. It doesn't work that way. But no, I don't think there'll be any, particularly when you get this close, fans, players, Coaches, not the only ones who get frustrated and want that taste again. When your ownership, when you get this close, and you know, Tatum and Jalen Brown, they watch Steph and Draymond. Those guys celebrate ownership when they see the other ownership celebrate. Particularly when one of them used to be one of them. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it drives you. I, I reject the notion that there is one percent of this ownership group that doesn't desperately want to win. Then you don't. You don't know these guys. I mean, it's not, that's, that is not an issue. Finding the right guys to spend the money on, that's a lot more complicated, but you don't spend it just for the sake of spending it. But I don't see any crazy financial restrictions on the Celtics at this time, which is another reason Celtics and Celtics fans are spoiled because it isn't that way in a lot of places. Have any parting thoughts? Draft David Roddy, please. <laughs> Can't tell by his uh, his Stan Twitter account. Yeah, we we did a whole hour, and you guys didn't ask about like TV or Mike Gorman or all the other stuff. It's like this is a breeze for me. I think this is, is he- the topic of all the uh, all the off season. You know, I know what's what's like a hard hitting, really dramatic question that we can ask John. Get him get him uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, God knows, but yeah, no, we'll, we'll see. How many guys are seriously hurt in that Celtics locker room after Game Six? Well, was it was it uh, Ty Lue a couple of years ago? Everybody's hurt. Everybody's <laughs> injured. Right. Everybody's hurt and everybody's playing. Everybody's hurt. We're yeah. all hurt. Yeah. Listen, I I like I am I do the least lifting, you know, heavy lifting there is. I'm the I'm the play by play announcer for the team. I'm exhausted. Right. Okay. Imagine uh, how many times Grant Williams is basically like been in a Tyson Fury heavyweight fight for the last six weeks. How many times has Grant Williams gotten clipped in the face in the last yeah. six weeks? It's happened like once or twice a game. He gets smashed. This stuff doesn't magically go away. 
Everybody, everybody is beat to death when you play 106 games. I love that we have, you know, shows throughout the offseason here on Celtics Beat. I like that it's a short offseason. We have much to cover week in, week out. We will maybe get to some draft stuff, depending on whether it looks like the Celtics are going to do anything of note, because, again, they don't have a first-round pick. And, of course, free agency. It's right around the corner. Sean certainly will join us again at some point because uh, I know he is always gracious with his time with us. And uh, stay with us. Exciting year. Almost. Almost got there. So close. Um, and it's it will sting for a little while, like Sean said. Be upset. You're allowed to be. Lord knows we all are for our various reasons. But, uh, you know, it, it, the June basketball, you can't beat it. Okay. Fred Valenti, Sean Grandi, we'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks.